Hello and welcome to the week 11 lecture on the mechanical universe, I'm sorry, the mechanical philosophy and the Newtonian universe. Um, what we're going to be doing in this lecture is really looking at what I think of as sort of the sequel to uh, the Copernican revolution or the kind of the final uh, conclusion of that revolution. So what we looked at last week was basically you know, the Aristotelian universe and then uh, Copernicus's work and how that served to alter it, but not a lot at first. Um, and then how the work of Brahe and Kepler and then Galileo uh, served to uh, complete some of the rest of the revolution, whereas Copernicus had just sort of switched the positions of the sun and the earth um, in the universe, but had left the rest of that universe in place. Then we saw how Brahe's measurements, the new stars, the recognition of the um, the, the comets, um, then uh, Kepler's work with the three planetary laws, and then Galileo's work with the telescope, seeing kind of the imperfections of the heavens, um, all contributed then to um, this this kind of revolution in the ideas of, of the universe and how the universe worked. But there were still a number of issues left to be resolved and that's what we're going to be looking at this week is the resolution of those issues and in the resolution of those issues the development of a new kind of philosophy called um, basically called the the mechanical philosophy and we'll be talking about what the mechanical philosophy is and then how it related to the Copernican Rev revolution and then how it all comes together and is, is finally resolved um, by Newton um, who is able to come to the conclusions and the resolution that he does and the, basically his laws of motion and the theory of gravity uh, through, his, um, through the mechanical philosophy, but in order to posit his final conclusion about gravity, he actually has to bring in um, some of the, the, the sort of invisible forces of the Aristotelian universe that he'd been wanting to get rid of. He actually has to rely on some things he doesn't like to. So um, in that sense, Newton's uh, universe was not a purely mechanical universe. So just keep that in mind, but he very much uses the steps of the mechanical philosophy to get to the conclusions that he does. So what we're going to start out by is talking about the remaining problems of the Copernican universe, um, you know, where we left off last time, and um, a, a series of issues then that various um, sort of natural philosophers are going to be dealing with. Um, and then, and so the, let me just go through those problems. First, they include um, the issue of a finite versus an infinite universe. Um, the the idea of terrestrial versus celestial mechanics and by what I what I mean by mechanics is basically issues of matter and motion um, what matter what what stuff is made of and how it behaves and how to explain its behavior and how to explain motions um, the, the motions of matter and so that's what we mean when we talk about mechanics so the idea of, of whether or not the terrestrial and the celestial uh, worlds work in the same way according to the same laws or not. Um, and then the idea of atomism or what is also called corpuscularianism <laughs> or corpuscularism, um, the idea that the world is made up of, you know, a whole or that the universe is actually filled with a whole bunch of little tiny, teeny indivisible particles that then interact in various ways. And we've seen atomism um, from the, the time of even the pre-Socratics, um, how it's, it's sort of come in and out of the picture uh, from the time of, of the ancients um, through the, this early modern period. But for the most part, it had lost out to the idea of the Arist of, of Aristotle's four elements, the um, the um, the idea that you have this sort of uh, divinely inspired and divinely uh, directed universe. 
uh, that was the Aristotelian universe versus um, the atomistic universe, which is sort of random um, and made up of, of sort of these random particles that are interacting in these random ways. Um, and so you, what you see is a real resurgence um, and increasing popularity of atomism or co corpuscularism in the 17th century uh, that then overtakes the idea of the Aristotelian uh, four elements. And so we're going to be looking at those issues that were brought up and not quite resolved by um, the Copernican revolution as we've looked at it so far. Then we're going to look at the ways that various um, uh, scholars that we're going to be looking at were able to solve those problems largely by creating a mechanical universe, by by explaining the the universe not with recourse to divine interactions, but um, looking at the universe in, in a mechanistic way um, and being able to explain uh, matter and motion, again, not by recourse to natural inclinations um, or some sort of divine intervention, but rather through purely mechanical principles that the world works like a machine, basically, kind of like a bit, you know, like a watch. Um, and when it's, once it's put in motion, it just um, keeps going, but through these very mechanical um, means uh, and not because of any kind of quality or um, nature that has been embedded within it, which is very much an Aristotelian idea. So a lot of this then is basically overthrowing once and for all the Aristotelian system, Aristotelian natural philosophy, and the Aristotelian universe. That's really what we're sort of looking at and then the final resolution of all of this and so to to look at the people who then are solving the problems we'll turn we'll look again at, at, at Galileo and this time look at the work that he did regarding motion or what's called kinematics um, basically explaining matter in motion and not so much explaining you know why the motion comes to be in the first place or why um, it behaves the way, say, the particles um, behave the way that they do, but rather just to explain the motion that you see and try to come up with mathematical laws. So that's something then that Galileo lends to the idea of, of the atomistic, the, me the mechanical universe and the atomistic worldview. Then we're going to turn to um, another really famous um, philosopher and, and uh, natural philosopher Rene Descartes uh, and his corpuscular universe that he, he makes up. Uh, then we're going to look at uh, the work of a man named Robert Hooke, an Englishman. I should say Descartes is French, Galileo is Italian, Hooke is, is English. Um, and then his explanation of circular motion. And then we'll um, conclude by looking at Newton and his laws of motion, and then finally his law of gravity. Because what Descartes and Hook and Newton were really trying to do uh, with this um, Copernican universe was to try to explain why it is that we see the motions we do in the heavens. Um, as we'll see in a minute, the, the idea of the, the, the divide between terrestrial and celestial mechanics gets wiped away with the, with the Copernican universe. So whereas Aristotle had said that you see circular motion in the heavens and basically straight or rectilinear motion on Earth, um, with the Copernican universe and the Earth no longer at the center of this universe, these sort of quote-unquote natural motions don't really work anymore and so you don't have a clear or easy explanation for the kinds of motions you see on earth versus the motions you see in the heavens and in particular it became very difficult to explain why you see circular or basically elliptical motions of the planets. What is it that's moving the planets in, in these orbits? If, if um, you know, the circular motion that was proposed by Aristotle as this inherent natural motion in the celestial sphere no longer holds, well then how do we explain those elliptical motions? And that's really what um, Descartes and Hooke and Newton are trying to explain and then what Galileo has done kind of provides some of the basis for that understanding as well. In addition, what you're going to see is an increasing 
tendency toward using mat finding mathematical laws and proportions to explain motion as well. We've already seen this with Kepler last week, and we're going to continue to see this with um, Galileo and then especially with Newton, um, who's actually able to bring some of Kepler's um, ideas and his, his ratios and proportions into a mathematical formula of gravity. Um, so our IDs then are going to be the mechanical philosophy, what is that, um, Rene Descartes, Robert Hooke, Isaac Newton, and then the idea of gravity or the theory of gravity. Um, and so you can see again that we are, um, you know, this week also looking into the quote-unquote kind of great men of science. These are the heroes of science um, and this is that sort of more traditional perspective from the history of science but um, this is absolutely just because it's sort of from the traditional um, interpretation or the traditional historiography doesn't mean that it's not important. Um, it's it's extremely important in explaining sort of the as I said the, the resolution of the Copernican revolution. Um, okay so let's move on then to the problems then that we're still left with the Copernican universe and where we uh, left off last week. And I'll go through this relatively quickly because we've we've covered these issues before, um, and this comes uh, from Capu uh, from from Kuhn's uh, last chapter of his book, um, and it's also discussed in Deere's uh, Revolutionizing the Sciences and, and the chapters that we read about uh, for this week as well, but, um, but a lot of this then comes from the Kuhn reading from last week too, sort of finishing some of this up. Um, so one of the issues then that the Copernicus, Copernican revolution raised for natural philosophers um, in were sort of now we're into the kind of early to mid 17th century. Um, Copernicus wrote um, De Revolutionibus in uh, 15, it was published in 1543. Uh, then we see, you know, Brahe's work, Kepler's work going into the later 16th century. Then Galileo um, is sort of writing um, early 17th century into the mid 17th century. Uh, and so this is where we are now. We're sort of in the kind of early to mid 1600s. I'm, I'm sorry, uh, yes, 1600s, the 17th century, sorry. Um, and so one of the issues then that Copernicus raised with um, his writings and by putting the, the sun at the center of the universe and then the earth in orbit around the sun was um, a destabilization of the idea of the Earth as the unique center of the universe. So Copernicus then put the Sun at the center of this unique universe, um, which was just fine with, say, Kepler as the Neoplatonist who wanted, who, who sort of equated the Sun with a deity. Um, he's happy to have the Sun in the center of this uh, bounded universe. But as we had talked about from last week, um, the Copernicans in order to uh, answer a, a number of different issues, including the issue of the idea of the, the horizon um, and points on the horizon disappearing just as other points appear, uh, and the whole idea of the, the parallax, um, these forced uh, Copernicus and his followers to greatly enlarge the size of the universe, I think to about 20 times the size of the Aristotelian um, uh, Ptolemaic universe. So the universe has become greatly uh, enlarged. The idea is that the Earth is is really, really, even though it's not in the center anymore, the Sun is at the center of this universe, the Earth is very, very close to the center um, and very far away from the sphere of the stars. So you've got this immense, enormous universe. So the universe is, is expanding and that's uh, basically the idea for the Copernicans, um, even you know as early as Copernicus's own writings. Um, along with that, then you have Neoplatonists uh, who begin to 
see the sphere of the fixed stars as not necessarily something that needs to be bounded. And unlike Aristotle, they were willing to concede that there might be empty space beyond the universe. So Aristotle had said there's no such thing as a void, there's no such thing as empty space. If you have space, you have matter in that space. Well, some of the Copernicans and, as I said, some Neoplatonists were willing to start to concede that, well, there just very well may be some empty space uh, in the universe and that perhaps beyond the sphere of the fixed, fixed stars, there may be just some, you know, empty space and that just goes on forever, that's just infinite so that our solar system might be bounded, but that beyond that you actually have an infinite universe. Um, and, and this is where God lives. This is where God and the angels reside. This is where heaven resides. And it went along with Christian ideas and Neoplatonic ideas of this omnipotent, which means all-powerful God, that a, that this God would not have, have made a bounded universe, that um, it's unnecessarily limiting to the powers of God to say that once you're past the universe, there can be nothing. Um, rather, if God wants to have an infinite universe, God can create an infinite universe. And then they start to say that it actually even makes more sense that God would have created an infinite universe to um, as, a, as a reflection of his you know, of his immense, great, unlimited power, that an unlimited universe fit better with a concept of a God with unlimited powers. And so you start to see um, the idea of a bounded, finite universe uh, picked apart and, and eventually um, really uh, completely uh, torn apart, I guess. I don't know if that's quite the word, but but rejected in favor of an infinite universe. Um, and so here is a drawing, then an image, I should say, of this idea of the infinite universe where you've still got, um, you know, different spheres with the stars. So there's still, this is still a somewhat traditional um, model of the universe. But if you look at the stars, they're no longer confined to one sphere, one rotating sphere, they actually are filling up this infinite universe. And it was also starting to be recognized with the use of the telescope that some stars were nearer and some stars were farther away. Some, some stars were um, bigger than others. Um, and you also have Neoplatonists who start to argue that each star you saw was its own sun with its own solar system. So in addition then to the size of the universe being expanded, you know, to an infinite proportions, um, they also start to argue that there may be multiple solar systems. Um, and they start to see more and more and more stars that they'd never seen before, again, with the use of, of the telescope. And so now you've got, you know, the Earth in a solar system that is no longer at the center of the universe for these Neoplatonists and the and, and certain astronomers that, that started to argue this as well. And if the Earth is no longer in the center, and the, and even and, and if the Sun is no longer in the center, and if this is not the only unique solar system, but instead there are possibly infinite numbers of solar systems, then you've got a host of other issues that go along with it. Because how then do you explain the motions that you see? So I talked about this a minute ago, but how do you explain then these sort of these elliptical or circular like orbits of these planets around the sun? Um, if the Earth is no longer at the center of a universe, then how do you explain why when you drop a stone, it goes down it, it, you know, it always goes down. It always tends to go toward the earth. Um, how do you explain air, say, going straight up, as, as Aristotle would have, have said? How do you explain um, that anything that's watery and heavy would again tend toward the earth um, if the earth is not the center of the universe around which uh, a spherical sort of ball would congeal? How do you explain these motions? So um, as we talked about for last week, the Aristotelian universe is just getting picked apart uh, even more and, and more. 
Um, so, so you've got this issue then of the infinite universe and over time that becomes a more and more accepted idea again with um, that, that then starts to present other kinds of problems. Um, so along these lines, and this is a related point, then there are more and more natural philosophers who start to believe that there is not a divide between the terrestrial and the celestial worlds. Um, whereas Copernicus had very much kept that dualism in place, again, he just switched the place of the sun and the moon, but other than that, it was an Aristotelian Ptolemaic universe, um, leading Kuhn to argue, as we talked about um, in discussion this week, that um, that really you can talk about Copernicus as the last great Ptolemaic um, sort of natural philosopher or astronomer. Um, but when you start to look into, um, you know, Kepler's ideas uh, and then um, Galileo's ideas, uh, this idea of the a separation between the terrestrial and the celestial world is really starting to break down. So with Kepler's laws of planetary motion, he is able to um, show that the planets are behaving according to uh, dynamics of motion to which he can give uh, mathematical laws and ratios. Uh, he's also shown that it's not a perfect circular orbit, but instead it's an elliptical orbit and the planets move at different speeds um, you know, in, in that orbit. So, so whereas Aristotle had said they'll, they will move in this perfect circle and it's, an, you know, at a never changing speed. And even with the Ta Ptolemaic epicycles, those are still circles. They're still going around circles, even though it sort of ends up being a spiral. It's still a circular uniform motion. Well, it's no longer circular and it's no longer a uniform motion. So that's been broken down. And then what we saw with Galileo is you've got imperfect on these planets as well and then some of the planets have moons that we didn't know about there's new stars appearing as we saw with Brahe there's comets that are not in the sublunary sphere so already these ideas of the the, the differentiation between the terrestrial world and the celestial world are breaking down and they begin to break down even further um, with subsequent astronomers and natural philosophers to the to the point where um, by the time you get to Galileo there's a pretty good sense that um, the mechanics and the, the dynamics of motion in the heavens are the same as those on earth. Now Kepler could not well, I'll get to this more in a little bit, but Kepler tried to explain the orbital motions of the planets by saying that it was the sun's rays that reached out and basically moved them around. And he gives kind of a mechanical explanation for this, but with the, with the idea of the sun's rays. Um, later, uh, later scholars will say, oh, it's because of their... Um, sort of an, in, an intrinsic motion within them. So Kepler argues this to a certain extent. Galileo argues this, that, this, that it, it's, it's the intrinsic nature of planets to revolve around the sun. That's not very satisfactory, but what we're going to see then as we move through um, the other um, natural philosophers we're going to be talking about uh, in the lecture, we'll see how they start to try to solve that problem. But the main point here is that there's growing recognition that terrestrial and celestial mechanics are guided by the same sets of principles and the same sets of laws. So if you talk about laws of motion on Earth, it's going to be the same as the heavens. And the same with matter. The Earth, I'm sorry, the matter that makes up the Earth is going to be similar to the matter that makes up the heavens. So the heavens and the Earth are not separate from each other in the sense that they are governed by the same laws and made up of similar kinds of, of matter. Uh, so that's another issue. Oh, sorry, this should have, well, I'll go one by one for this. So let me start with atomism and then what explains the motion of planets. So another issue that comes up with, um, that was raised by um, the, the Copernican universe was the idea of 
uh, atomism versus the four elements. And so what Kuhn argues is that the idea of the infinite universe with um, a possibly infinite number of solar systems displacing our solar system from the, the center, no longer having a clear uh, center for this universe, um, and along those lines then having the same laws for what's on heaven, what's, what's, what's on earth, for what's in the heavens. Um, this all was very much part of early atomistic uh, theories. And so we had talked about, you know, early on in the semester, um, the pre-Socratics of um, Leucippus and Democritus, who had both um, posed the idea of a, um, an atomistic universe. So whereas you had um, Aristotle and uh, Empedocles, um, and then as we saw Hippocrates and Galen had all um, suggested and followed the idea that you've got uh, four elements, that the universe is made up of four elements, earth, air, uh, fire, and water. Um, there were others who were what we call atomists who said, no, 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 the earth is made up of a whole bunch of different kinds of particles and that these particles um, have, you know, very few intrinsic properties that are associated with them. They might have weight, they might have some sort of density, um, or, or they might have a particular kind of shape, but they don't have the same kinds of qualities that, um, that Aristotle had and I should say, and others had actually attributed to the different elements. If you remember, they had argued that there are four elements and that these elements um, had different dominant qualities. They could be hot, cold, wet, or dry and have combinations of those qualities depending on which element it was. And then for terrestrial objects, depending on the proportion of the different elements they have in them that they were made up of. They would demonstrate these different kinds of qualities. Um, Aristotle also invested them with um, earth, air, fire, and water with qualities of heaviness and lightness, which again would sort of determine their motion, either falling toward earth or falling away from earth, sort of going you know straight up or straight down. And so for the people who embraced the idea of the four elements, there were all these sort of intrinsic qualities and they had certain natures, they had certain potentialities um, that would make them act in a certain way. And so for Aristotle, um, an object like say a stone um, would be made up of a certain combination of elements, mainly earth, so that it would demonstrate the main qualities of earth, cold and dry and heavy, that would tend toward the earth if it were uh, dropped. Um, and for things like seeds, uh, for plants, what Aristotle argued is that within a seed, it would have a certain potentiality. And so it would go through these different um, causes. If you remember, Aristotle talked about the four different causes, which was basically an explanation for growth and for motion. And for our Aristotle, each uh, thing had a what he called a final cause it had within it some sort of potentiality something that it was meant to do or destined to be and that it would spend its entire existence basically um, realizing that potential so that each thing had within it this intrinsic nat nature which would induce it or impel it to act in a certain way so this is um in this Aristotelian universe then, terrestrial objects were imbued with all kinds of qualities and behaviors automatically. Whereas in the atomistic universe, um, these, these particles have very, very few qualities. Um, and they are um, instead randomly sort of moving throughout the universe and when they bump into each other, they might combine or they might break apart um, and then or they might, you know, one might be moving in a certain direction and then it might get hit with another particle and then move in another direction. And it's all this sort of swirling random um, action and that that is what for um, the atomistic 
philosophers. That is what explained motion in the universe and change. And it was very, very random. Whereas for Aristotle, change is not random at all. It's, it's imbued within the objects themselves. And all of this then derives from a prime mover, from some kind of divine source of power that's then instilled in all of these objects. So it's a divinely inspired universe. It's a what we call a teleological universe that's sort of going, um, that, how can I say this, in, in which each part of it is acting in the way it should, in a way that was de designed by this divine source. Um, and so this is, uh, you know, Plato's idea as well with the Demiurge, that you have this divine originator of a universe. I don't want to say a creator, because for Aristotle, the universe was never created it has had, had always been in existence it was eternal but at the same time it was designed by this you know divine um, entity that designed each part of it to work in just the right way so that this universe would work atomists by contrast did not see any kind of divine plan um, in the universe, no kind of divine direction. Um, and again, it was it's it's completely random. Um, and so what Kuhn argues, so to get back to <laughs> to what I was talking about with the Copernican universe, what Kuhn argues then is that the Copernican universe, while it was not for, for Copernicus um, or Kepler, it was not an atomistic universe at all. Um, the other characteristics of it that, that end up coming out of the Copernican revolution lend themselves to atomism. And what you see in the 17th century is a great increase in atomistic theories to the point where they really displace the idea of the Aristotelian four elements and the Aristotelian sort of natures and potentialities and final causes, um, that atomism really comes to to replace this and to um, to sort of, um, what's the word, um, get really get rid of Aristotelian thought. Um, that and, and the atomism that they are embracing then is characteristic of this kind of mechanistic universe um, where you might have a God who's put it all and who's created it and put it all in place, but this God is, um, is not going to be interfering. And in that way, you can see some commonalities with the Platonic and the Aristotelian universe. But by contrast, in the atomistic universe, this God has not placed particular natures and behaviors and qualities within these atoms to make them act in a certain way. Instead, these atoms are purely neutral little particles that are just interacting in these random ways to create the universe that we see. Um, so just to go back a little bit, the, the Copernican universe then leads to the idea of an infinite universe. It leads to the idea that you that celestial and terrestrial mechanics work exactly the same way. You don't have a difference between heavens and earth. They are all part of the same system working in the same way. And this these two ideas then lend themselves to a triumph of atomistic ideas in the 17th century. So atomism sort of triumphs over the idea of the four elements and the idea of, of the Aristotelian natures. Uh, and so this, um, these are all sort of um, after effects of the initial Copernican revolution. Um, but what is left uh, in terms of, of the problems of this atomistic universe is how do you explain the motion of the planets? And so what we then see is um, the different uh, philosophers, natural philosophers um, and astronomers trying to figure this out. And again, increasingly accepting the idea of the infinite universe of, um, you know, uh, mechanistic laws that guide both the earth and the heavens and that also um, is an atomistic random universe as well. Um, but they 
need to be able to explain the motion of the planets within this universe. So now we'll go through um, the different teachings of these different um, scholars and how they eventually sort of lead to the idea of um, Newton's laws of motion and then Newton's um, theory of gravity and his law of well, the law law of gravity. I, I'll just leave it at that. Okay, so let's turn to then the mechanical universe and the solving of the problems, the remaining problems of the Copernican uh, universe. And the first person I want to talk about is Galileo and then the work he did on what we call kinematics, which is basically the study of motion or, or the sort of the behavior of motion or the laws of motion without looking into the causes of motion which is what we call dynamics so it's basically kinematics is basically just trying to um, observe and understand and measure motion itself again rather than trying to um, to understand what was the cause of the motion in the first place um, we talked about Galileo last week in terms of the Copernican revolution because he had put one of the kind of final nails in the coffin, if you want to put it that way, of the Aristotelian universe by using the telescope to um, be able to observe the moon, the sun, uh, the moons of Jupiter. Um, he was able to see the sunspots and then the mountains and the craters on the moon and again sort of add in one more idea of the imperfection of the heavens. Um, but Galileo was also committed to overturning um, the Aristotelian universe um, in terms of uh, also um, taking apart Aristotle's ideas of motion. Uh, not so much looking at sort of final causes or the, as I said, the, the causes of motion, but rather um, kind of attacking Aristotelian ideas of motion itself. So again, not at this point uh, critiquing Aristotle's explanation for, say, why a stone would fall to earth. I mean, the idea that it's then it, it's just trying to find its natural place. And once it goes to its natural place, it's going to stop moving. That didn't interest or concern Galileo as much as um, Aristotle's uh, explanation of the laws of motion and, and measuring that motion. And one of the things that Aristotle had argued was that if you drop two objects and one is heavier than the other, then the heavier one will fall faster. And in a kind of famous uh, experiment that it's not actually clear if Galileo ever did this or not, there's actually um, a lot of um, uh, argumentation or debate among historians of whether this was a just a thought experiment that he did or an actual experiment. Um, one thing that that sort of is thought to be um, an experiment that Galileo carried out and again whether he did or not we're not sure but was that he stood in the leaning tower of Pisa um, in the city of Pisa in Italy there's this um, tower I imagine you've heard of this before but that wasn't built properly and is literally sort of leaning which you can see in that kind of the middle uh, image there that he went to the top of the leaning tower of Pisa and then he dropped two uh, two balls, one that was much heavier than the other, and what he found was that they they landed, they hit the ground at the exact same time, and he was able to then point out the flaw in Aristotle's reasoning and say that no, as long as two objects have basically the same density and are dropped in the same medium, say through air uh, in this case, then with you know a similar uh, amount of, of resistance um, in that medium then they will fall actually at the same rate no matter what the mass is no matter what their basically their weight is no matter you know how much matter is there no matter what they weigh they will um, they will fall at the same at the same pace and not through this argumentation he was actually able to find fault then with Aristotle's ideas um, and one of uh, another argument he made against this um, 
Aristotle's arguments was that say you you had two stones that were going to be you know dropped through the air um, and that then they were linked together with with a cord so that they became essentially one object then uh, according to Aristotle they should suddenly start falling faster and for Galileo this was um, a logical fallacy this couldn't be true and so this is where he got the idea and then again um, possibly did some actual experimentation possibly not um, but at any rate was able to determine that objects will fall at the same rate no matter what their mass is, no matter if one's heavier or one's lighter, um, they'll fall at the same weight. I mean, I mean, at the same rate. And not only that, but he was able to give a descriptive, um, basically formula for this. Um, he was able to argue that um, acceleration, that, that this is what they called uniformly difform motion, which we call acceleration. So um, if you say roll a ball down an inclined plane, as in this image here, what you will see is that the object will go faster and faster and faster the more time that elapses and that that increase in speed is actually proportional to the amount of time that it's going down the plane um, and so that even though its motion is changing as it's going faster and faster and faster it's changing at a uniform rate and so again this is what they called in the middle ages uniformly difform motion so motion that is not uniform but that is changing at the same rate is changing in a uniform way again we think of this as acceleration um, so Galileo was able to basically come up with a formula for this even though he didn't put it in the algebraic terms that we would use say today you know using letters to express these formulas he did describe this relationship um, and describe it in such a way that late people were later able to make it into a formula um, in which he said that distance is proportional to the amount of time um, I'm sorry, that acceleration, in acceleration, distance is proportional to the square of the amount of time um, that the object is, say, um, is accelerating. So um, basically, in, in this case, uh, you've got this ball that starts at zero seconds, then at one second it's gone a certain amount of distance, and then at two seconds it's gone um, a bigger distance, at three seconds it's gone even further, and again, um, Galileo was able to describe that by saying if you take the amount of time and square it, say, you know, one second squared, two seconds squared, three seconds squared, um, that's going to be proportional to the amount of distance then that in this case that the ball has rolled so that we would call it an exponential uh, relationship that it's um, that the the distance that the ball goes it, it's going to go further and further and further with each with each unit of time and if you square the amount of time then you'll be able to know how far that it's gone don't worry too much about this the, the main point so here's another um, kind of example of this the main point here is just to show you that Aris, that that Galileo was interested in showing the flaws of Aristotle's argumentation, uh, not only in the Aristotelian universe, but we with regard to Aristotle's uh, laws of motion or ideas of motion and and how it what how to describe that motion. And I should also say that this built on um, some of the arguments of Nicole O'Reim. We know that his name keeps coming up, um, not only uh, because of the impetus theory that we had learned about, but we also know he had suggested a possible uh, sun-centered universe. And now we also see that he had suggested this idea of uniformly difform motion also, um, you know, over a century prior to to Galileo, um, but Galileo is able to put this into sort of a final uh, proportion here as well. So Galileo is trying to then again question and break down Aristotle's um, ideas about motion and natural motion here. Um, so again, here's his sort of law of acceleration that distance is proportional to the square of the time elapsed.
Um, so that's what I wanted to say about um, Galileo in this case, sort of talking about the, the, the mechanical universe. But now I want to turn to um, the contribution of Rene Descartes and the corpuscular universe or the atomistic universe that he uh, proposed. So let's turn then to the next step in uh, solving the problems of the initial uh, Copernican universe um, in the making of the kind of a mechanical universe or a, a universe that um, is sort of constructed of and conceived by uh, mechanical philosophy. And that involves looking at uh, Rene Descartes and his um, theory of corpuscles or basically his atomistic uh, theory of the universe which has a great influence on Newton and is a really important step again and in, in sort of um, it sort of provides one more step toward uh, the theory of gravity that we're sort of heading heading toward in this lecture. Um, so who was Rene Descartes? Uh, Rene Descartes was um, a French uh, elite man born in 1596. Uh, he was educated at a Jesuit school um, the Jesuits were actually members of a religious order called the Society of Jesus that was established in the 16th century um, in Catholicism. And Jesuits very quickly gained a reputation as great scholars and they established schools all over Europe and in the Americas and really were sort of the premier uh, educational institutions of the early modern period. Uh, so Descartes was educated at a, at a Jesuit college and then went on to law school. Then he joined the army as, as a mercenary and went to the Netherlands um, through that uh, enterprise. And in the Netherlands, he met a man named Isaac uh, Beekman, who had an, a tremendous impact on his life. Um, Beekman was interested in um, sort of corpuscular uh, theories um, in atomism. He was interested in hydrostatics. He was interested in, in math, uh, mathematics, and understanding, um, trying to understand uh, motion and how um, motion could could be measured, how you could understand uh, motion, and again had a, a, a huge influence on Descartes and the way that he he saw the world. Um, and Descartes then wrote a number of treatises that I'll show you in just a second. He's, he's an extremely famous um, philosopher and natural philosopher. Um, you can see on the left is an image of his tomb, uh, and then on the right is a monument to Descartes. Um, you may have heard of him before. He's, he's really famous in European intellectual history and in, in the history of science, uh, largely because of the ideas that I'll I'll be talking about here. Um, so Descartes lived in the 17th century and he wrote a whole series of texts, um, some of the most important of which um, are um, The World or Le Monde in French, which is on the, the left hand side. Um, then next to it is The Discourse on Method. Um, he also wrote a book called um, basically Principles of Philosophy and then um, a series of of other works as well uh, that became very well known throughout Europe. He had a, a, a huge influence and his goal was no less than to completely supplant and basically get rid of Aristotelian philosophy and cosmology. What he wanted to do was provide an alternate system to the Aristotelian universe and Aristotelian natural philosophy. And so he basically tried in these writings to provide a complete alternate to basically all of Aristotle's ideas. And so that Descartes instead of Aristotle could be seen as sort of the philosopher and the natural philosopher of the early modern world. Um, so very anti-Aristotelian and again trying to um, basically dislodge Aristotle's continued influence in the early modern world. Now what we're seeing with the the Copernican revolution is that it really is serving to tear apart um, a lot of the most basic conce concepts of Aristotelian cosmology and natural philosophy. Um, and so this was already taking place. It was already 
happening, but Descartes was trying to basically provide an, an entire alternate um, model and system to get rid of any remaining Aristotelianism um, in early modern Europe. You could even argue according to, you know, um, like according to the Kuhnian ideas of, of paradigms and the structure of scientific revolutions we talked about last week that maybe he was trying to put in place a completely new paradigm. It would actually be interesting. I, I don't I don't know of anyone who's ever written on this. I don't think that um, Kuhn has ever written on this either. But to me, he's trying to put a new paradigm in place um, to replace the Aristotelian paradigm. And in doing that, what he proposes is a thoroughly corpuscularian um, atomistic universe. Um, he's getting rid of four elements. He's getting rid of intrinsic uh, qualities and natures. And he's making this a thoroughly uh, random atomistic universe. Um, so I'm going to go through kind of what that universe is. But first, we have to start with um, Descartes' His, his method or the very basis upon which he began um, his philosophy and on which he based um, his philosophy and his writings um, that in, and that he's really, really famous for too. Um, I'll just show you, this is an image of him writing uh, one of his books or a painting of him writing his, his book, uh, Le Monde or The World. Basically, he's providing a, a new entire system of the world. So imagine he was not a particularly modest or humble man. <laughs> That's the sense that you get when you read about um, Descartes. But at any rate, uh, he definitely made an impact. Um, so anyway, and, and I should say his atomism really dominated the se much of the 17th century until Newton comes along. Um, what we call the Cartesian philosophy coming from Descartes. Cartesian ideas and Cartesian philosophy really dominates uh, European uh, philosophy and natural philosophy. So what was his uh, philosophy? What Descartes tried to do in order to completely displace the Aristotelian um, universe and Aristotelian ideas was he tried to anticipate what his detractors or, or crit critics would argue against him the, the sort of skeptical ideas that they would or skeptical questions that they would place to him if if they could about his um, philosophy and his universe um, and so he tried to get rid of all his preconceived ideas about nature and about everything he knew and how he knew it and just come down to some absolutely fundamental principle about the world that could not be questioned and could not be shaken no matter how skeptical somebody was. And what he came to was that the one thing he could know for sure is that he existed, that he could know that he, he was there, that he's here on earth, that, he, that his body and his mind existed. And he knew this because he could think. Um, and so what he argued is is that the one true thing he knows and the true basis of knowledge is is the absolute indisputable fact of his own existence and the way he expressed that was in this famous statement i think therefore i am because i can think thoughts because i know that i exist then I must exist. And that is the one thing that I can know. And so existence of material bodies um, was the one true basis for Descartes' philosophy and for Descartes' world that he thought nobody could argue ag against him on that. Um, and here's a, a, again, this is sort of, it was uh, first written in French, then translated into Latin. So the Latin is um, cogito ergo sum means I think therefore I am you may have heard this phrase before again it's very famous but this is sort of the basis of Descartes epistemology of his uh, the way that he would formulate and construct true knowledge about the universe that it, it all boiled down to this this was the basis so I think therefore I am and then from that what he then um, argued was that the 
that human bodies are matter, that we exist, and that in the universe there are other objects, that there is matter in the universe, that the universe is actually made up of matter. And for Descartes, matter wasn't earth, air, fire, and water. It wasn't made up of those elements. He actually distinguished between three different kinds of elements. There were sort of large particles, um, then there were sort of smaller particles, and then there were tiny, tiny particles that would sort of fill up the space between the larger kinds of particles. Um, so he called those three elements, but he gives them no other characteristics, um, say like Aristotle did with earth, air, fire, and water. All he could say about these elements, about this matter, was that it took up space. <laughs> that was basically his argument. And so in that sense, for Descartes, the only characteristic of matter was that it, it was made up of geometric extension in space. That it basically, that's a fancy way of saying it just takes up space. Matter takes up space. Um, and for Descartes, that matter would have no other characteristics. Um, any other kinds of qualities like hot, cold, wet, dry, any kind of taste or smell or color, all the things that Aristotle had talked about as either accidental um, qualities or substantial qualities, so the things that make a thing what they are or the characteristics then that are not intrinsic to um, matter, all these qualities for Descartes had nothing to do with the matter itself. It was all about how your mind perceived perceived those qualities. So if you know you eat dinner and it tastes really good for Matt, for Descartes, that's all in your mind. It had nothing to do with the the qualities inherent to the food that you were eating. That food is basically just matter that takes up space. Um, so again, he attributed no qualities to matter beyond the fact that um, that it takes up space. Um, and, and this is somewhat separate, and we won't go into this in any detail, but this goes along with, for Descartes, a mind-body di di dichotomy in which the mind was completely separate from the body so that the mind would perceive qualities um, in matter, but again, it wasn't because of the matter itself. And so in that sense, the body is sort of taking in, when you're eating food, for instance, the body's taking in this matter, but it's your mind that is perceiving any kind of qualities from that food. Again, and there's this divorce between mind and body. Um, and so this matter is inert. It's just these random particles so you, and it's it's basically another way to think about it it's it's dead there's no life to it there's no um, intrinsic nature that's going to make it act in a certain way and even for Descartes the, the matter that makes up the human body would have been dead and it's the the mind that basically enlivens and then brings um, action and perception um, to the body so that any kind of matter, again, is, is what we call inert. It's not moving um, sort of of its own accord or it's not going to be developing. It's all any kind of movement that you're going to see with matter is all going to be the result of random collisions between different particles of matter. Um, so for Descartes, then matter was is made up of these random, and I would add to that, inert particles and they fill the universe. This is the universe is, is filled up with them. For for Descartes, there was actually no void. Those those little teeny elements um, that I talked about a few minutes ago would fill up every single space between the bigger kind of. You could think of them as like little globules or little, um, you know, particles, globules, however you want to think about them, um, droplets, kind of thing. Um, that you have larger ones and then you have little tiny ones that fill up literally every little bit of space. So this is a full universe, um, but unlike for Aristotle, it's not made up of these different elements. It's made up of these random particles, again, whose only characteristic is the space that they take up. Um, and so here's a, an image of this. There's some diagrams from uh, Descartes' writing of this system, of these these corpuscles and I'll talk about the vortices in just a second we'll we'll get there in just a minute but so this is sort of you know a vision of Descartes universe filled with 
particles, random particles that are just running into each other, jamming into each other, changing each other's directions as they're doing this. And so for Descartes, motion in this universe is determined by the collision of all these little particles or globules in this universe. Um, that any motion you see um, is not because of, again, some final cause or some kind of um, intrinsic nature or potentiality within matter. It's all just because it was sitting there and then it got hit by another particle and then it zooms off in a direction. And for Descartes, and this is, this is um, an import, important part of this argument as well, motion of these particles was naturally straight. It was rectilinear motion. And so if a motion started going off in some direction, Descartes argued that it would just continue on in that direction until hit by another particle that might push it off into another direction. Um, and that this is happening all of the time. Um, he doesn't give any um, initial cause for why this motion started in the first place. Um, so he sort of avoids the whole issue of causation. Um, so this is, again, like um, Galileo, this is kinematics. This is a description of the motion once it's in motion. Um, it's not explaining dynamics. It's not explaining the causes of this motion. And he actually sort of avoids that whole question. Um, and even even though he sees this as a universe that has a God within it, um, he, he largely um, avoids any kind of discussion that would bring in God um, as a causation, again, for this kind of motion. This is a random universe that has developed according to these random collisions by these inert particles that have no other qualities of their own. Um, and so, so um, to go back to this then, the, to my, this final point is, I'm sorry, the, the current point <laughs> is that if motion is determined by the collision of particles, um, what he's arguing is that when one particle sort of hits another, it will send it off into it, it, it will send it off into one direction and it would continue along that direction forever unless it got hit by something else or unless some sort of you know the medium that it's traveling in has resistance that will eventually slow it down. So this might start to sound familiar. This is an early um, argument for inertia. Um, inertia is the um, the concept that of motion that if something is at rest, it will stay at rest unless something pushes it, unless it, something acts on it. And on the flip side of that, something in motion will continue um, to will will continue in that motion unless some other kind of force acts, or until some other kind of force acts upon it. So this, you're starting to see an early idea of inertia then that's going to be built upon and developed again by uh, later thinkers. Um, but for now we'll just think of it um, in Descartes philosophy that you've got these particles moving. When one particle hits another it'll zoom off in some direction and it'll keep going until another particle hits it and then knocks it into another direction etc etc etc. If it finally slows down it'll just stay there in one spot until something hits it. So in that sense, you could say, well, this sounds kind of like um, Aristotelian natural motion in the, the sense that um, when things reach their natural place, they will stay at rest. But it's, it's really quite different from that because what Descartes is saying is there's no natural motion for these particles. There's no natural resting place. Um, there's no place that they are striving to get toward that would be their natural place in the universe as Aristotle had argued. Again, this is, this is a random universe and these are random collisions. Um, and so again, this, this then, um, this next point goes to what I was just saying is that for Descartes, particles at rest or in motion would remain that way unless acted on by other particles um, in, in this uh, system.
Um, and you can see this here. Here's a diagram of Descartes' idea of this early idea of inertia, that if you have this, um, say, this, this stone and it's going to fall, um, if that hand were to let go of that stone, you would see it would just continue down toward D. It would go from point A down toward um, point D, right? But if something else came along, um, say uh, another particle came along this uh, horizontal line here, then uh, if it hit it, then it would start to um, then it would move to the position B. Then what you would see is it would move over here to position B. If then another particle hit it um, sort of perpendicular to point B, then you would see it at point F, um, and then it might tend, if it were to go straight from there, it would tend toward point G. Um, so what, what this is showing is what happens when there are different collisions taking place and then the different directions that it would change um, that falling object toward. Uh, and as you can see, if you have enough points along that um, trajectory, you're going to start to get a curve. And so this is going to be important in a, in a few minutes. You'll start to see um, how this all fits together. Um, so for uh, Descartes, what happens is that with all of these particles that are constantly colliding with each other, the overarching motion of the universe, this is what Descartes argues, that you would see was these big, huge swirls. So he made these arguments that the particles, um, and this part I have to say I find difficult to, to make that leap from these randomly interacting particles to these big swirls. Um, but what he argued is that um, because of the motion of the particles, some would be forced um, out to the exterior where others then would come into the interior to replace where those particles had been, a lot like a whirlpool. Um, so you have these, these particles that would be constantly replacing the ones that had just left that and so you end up with what he called these vortices or a vortex. A vortex is basically like a big swirl like a whirlpool. So what he argued is that the universe is actually made of from all these interacting particles that they the overall pattern that they end up producing is this a huge set of is a huge vortex and that there's a whole bunch of them. So you have a whole bunch of vortices. So the, the, the plural for vortex is vortices. And so what you end up with, then I'll, we'll look at this picture again, is Descartes' image of the universe with all these different vortices. So in the, this middle, um, say this middle diagram, one vortex would be at point S, another vortex is at point A, um, you've got another vortex over here at point E. And so to then relate, you might be wondering, what does this all have to do with the Copernican revolution? What Descartes argues is that at each vortex is basically a sun, that they represent a solar system. Um, so you've got at point A, there's a sun. At point um, S over here and at point E over here, that's a sun. And then you've got these... Um, then you've got planets then that swirl around the sun because they're carried along by all of these particles then that are swirling around the sun like a whirlpool. That basically this explains the planetary motion and the orbits of the planets around the sun um, because of uh, Descartes' corpuscularian, um, corpuscular universe and his explanation of how all of these particles interact. Um, so this is then another step toward explaining the motion of matter in on Earth and in space um, and explaining the the orbits of the planets around the Sun. Uh, so that's basically Descartes universe. So here's an, another image of Descartes universe um, which it, it looks really, you know, similar to that uh, bounded universe of the, the 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 Copernicans. So take this with a grain of salt. But I liked this because you can see um, the sort of the sphere of the stars here and this idea of the the vortices um, 
of this this universe uh, that that Descartes is talking about and the ways that again the planets are going to be revolving around the Sun because of these vortices. So now we've looked at Galileo and kinematics and basically the laws of motion that he was applying to the idea of acceleration of falling bodies. Uh, we've looked at Descartes and the corpuscularian sort of atomistic universe that he had created and the laws of motion um, that he had proposed and in particular um, his uh, ideas of early uh, con concepts of inertia and then making a mechanical explanation for the orbits of the different planets in the solar system. So it's no longer this idea of the sun's rays reaching out or this idea of, sort of some sort of intrinsic uh, nature of heavenly bodies to move in a circular uh, orbit. Rather, it's explained for Descartes at least by the you know pushing and pulling and constant collisions of these different corpuscles in his universe. Um, and now we're going to turn to a man named Robert Hooke and look at how he's applying these ideas to the idea of the planetary orbits and um, basically coming up with an idea for as to why we see these circular or basically elliptical curved orbits of the the plants and um, of the planets, <laughs> and he is actually uh, proposing an idea, as we'll see, of two different forces that are acting upon each other in order for these curved orbits to be taking place. And so we'll, he's, he basically builds on Descartes' idea of inertia, um, and he's also building on the idea that um, the heavens and the earth have the same uh, laws of matter and motion uh, applying to them, so that you can do demonstrations on earth to understand what's happening in the heavens. Um, so again, you can use sort of uh, motions that you see on Earth, um, demonstrations of different kinds of motions, falling bodies, and, and in particular, they make particular use, and Hook makes particular use of the pendulum to understand this uh, circular motion. So I'll talk about that in just a minute. But I'm going to have to go back a little bit to explain um, the, the various uh, elements of Hooke's ideas and how they developed. So first let me just talk about Hooke himself. Um, Robert Hooke was uh, an English natural philosopher. Uh, he was highly educated. He was um, interested in studying astronomy but also is very famous for developing the microscope and then um, using that to study uh, fossils and actually uh, propose a early evolutionary um, model of biological development. Uh, he turns his microscope to tiny little animals and then is able to draw them in great detail, which you can see in this uh, image here on the right hand side. Uh, and so he's, he's very well known for that. Um, but he also was uh, provided a very important step, um, say, between Descartes and Newton in terms of coming up with the idea of the law of gravity and the, the concept of gravity. Um, so and explaining, as I said a minute ago, the curved uh, orbits of the planets around the sun. So um, Hooke was actually a member of what's called the Royal Society of London that was established in 1660. He was actually the director of experiments there. Uh, and I didn't assign the chapter in Deer on various uh, scientific institutions that develop in the 16th and 17th century where natural philosophy and experimentation um, was taking place. I should say the study of natural philosophy was taking place largely through uh, experiments and studies of the natural world. Um, and the Royal Society then was one of these institutions that was founded by natural philosophers and was given a charter by the King of England in 1662. And as you can see, it was sort of a 
it, it, this was a very much an elite institution of elite educated men who were the members and then they would meet there regularly again to, to sort of conduct experiments, um, give public demonstrations of these experiments and talk about the findings and they were largely committed to what they called the new science. So the in the 17th century the, the corpuscular uh, universe, the idea of, of atomism and mechanism and trying to study motion and come up with laws of motion and as we'll see Newton also becomes a member and then later the president of the Royal Society as well. The Royal Society still exists to this day. It's the longest um, running uh, scientific institution uh, in, in Europe and has this sort of very sort of grand <laughs> uh, history to it. Uh, so anyway, this is an image on the left of, of what it looked like in the 17th century and then on the right is its present uh, current location in London. Um, and here's an image of the library of the Royal Society. You can see it. If any of you ever watched Downton Abbey, it looks a lot like, <laughs> you know, Downton Abbey. So this is still a very much an, an elite institution um, that has, you know, these scientific fellows that belong to the Royal Society. Um, it also has a long history of producing uh, a journal called the Philosophical Transactions that were uh, begun in the 17th century under the direction of Henry Oldenburg, who was also a member of the Royal Society. Um, and as I said, experiments would take place at the Royal Society, and Hooke was actually in charge of the experiments that would take place in the Royal Society. So these are various sort of demonstrations, um, you know, demonstrations, experiments that were done with light. They were trying to figure out, you know, is what is light composed of? Is it rays? Is it particles? Is it waves? So there was a lot of experimentation on the nature of light at the Royal Society. Moving into the 18th century, there's lots of experimentation on um, electricity. Uh, there's also anatomical demonstrations as well. Uh, you also have in Paris, established in 1635, um, an Academy of Sciences uh, that was very much supported by the French government in which, again, the, the elite, um, the most advanced sort of natural philosophers slash scientists of the time were all members and um, the Academy of Sciences received a huge amount of sort of government support and funding for uh, scientific experiments that were going on there as well. There's also various academies established um, in Italy. Uh, you also see academies of sciences established in the 18th century uh, in Spain and in Portugal. So this is a European-wide phenomenon and what these institutions were really important for was establishing another institutional base for natural philosophy um, and then the development of science um, apart from the universities. So the universities were still very much uh, in the scholastic tradition, still employing a lot of the ancient Greek works and then the Arabic translations. And these institutions then were often dedicated to the most cutting edge, kind of like I said, new science, moving away from uh, scholasticism moving away from the Aristotelian universe. And in the traditional historiography of science, they're often touted as, you know, these beacons of progress and the universities then are um, painted in a, in a very sort of bleak conservative picture that they were just mired in conservatism in the, you know, superstition and backward, you know, Aristotelian ideas. And I think that gets way overblown. So just take that with a grain of salt. But these these institutions definitely provide new avenues for um, scientific investigations uh, that were free from some of the constraints of the university institution. So Hooke was um, was part of this. As I said, he was a member of the Royal Society. Newton was a member of the Royal Society uh, in in England as, as English scientists. Um, and Hooke basically, as I said a minute ago, he proposes an explanation as to why you see the curved sort of elliptical orbits of the planets as a result of two different forces, not as a result of these planets' inherent nature that's going to make them, you know, travel in a circle. That idea, that Aristotelian idea of this natural motion of the heavens being circular has been completely debunked at this stage among the sort of the members of the Royal Society and of the kind of the cutting edge of scientific research. Um, and instead, as I said, 
Kepler begins by proposing an alternate of this sort of the the sun's rays kind of reaching out the anima uh, motrix is what he called it uh, but it's really with Hooke that we start to see new ideas being developed that then Newton uh, builds upon even more and then it is able to come up with his idea of the law of gravity from this. Um, so why am I showing you then a slide of a different person right now, uh, William Gilbert? It's because Hooke's ideas required the work of someone prior to him, which was William Gilbert, uh, who lived in the late uh, 16th century, another British uh, natural philosopher. And he wrote a book called De Magnete, or basically on the magnet uh, that was published in 1600 and in that book he proposes the idea and this is an I this wasn't a, a completely new idea earlier natural philosophers had proposed this um, but he comes he in his book he basically um, fully fleshes out the idea that the earth has a magnetic field that the earth and actually all of the planets are big huge magnets um, and that they they basically attract one another and this is true of the sun as well so in the entire solar system all the different heavenly bodies in it are basically magnetic and they are attracted to each other and part of this idea comes from the idea of the compass as we talked about a few weeks ago um, it was recognized that the earth had magnetic polarities at the North Pole and the South Pole and that's why compasses work so the earth's kind of magnetic um, character was recognized much earlier on but applying this idea to the entire solar system is what um, Gilbert is doing in this book uh, on magnets and this has then a, a major impact on then the the astronomers and astronomical thinking moving into the 17th century as they're trying to settle these remaining issues with the Copernican revolution so um, Gilbert's ideas so a diagram of basically the solar system and um, is from Gilbert's book is, is on the, the far left of these three images here so you can see uh, Gilbert's um, depiction here of this magnetic Sun in the center then you've got the earth uh, with its moon circulating around it again the, the product of magnetic forces um, and then again just to sort of reinforce what I talked about earlier in the lecture you can see this is an infinite universe the stars are not all just on this one starry heaven um, they are staying still <laughs> they don't move anymore and they have now spread out into this infinite universe so you can see I like that um, diagram because you can see that there as well this is you can see that in Gilbert's thinking as well this idea of the infinite universe and the stationary stars um, that are you know filling up this universe basically um, but on the the right two diagrams can sort of show you this idea of the earth's magnetic field so the the recognition that um, the earth has magnetic properties um, and what uh, Gilbert and others started to argue was that because of their magnetic properties things like falling bodies will tend toward the center of these magnetic bodies basically so so the the um, the earth's magnetism revolves around its um, magnetic core at its very very center and again this similar to Aristotle this explains why these heavenly bodies are in the shape of spheres because things are going to tend toward their center but in this case it's because of magnetism and not because the earth is at the center of the universe and natural motion tends down you know or I should say that heavy bodies will tend to to um, congeal at the center so that it's a different set of reasoning why from Aristotle and that means that in the solar system you have many many different centers the Sun has its own magnetic center the earth has its own center and each of the planetary planets has their own center as well and as we know many of the planets have their own moons that will revolve around their magnetic center as well um, so there's this growing realization that the planetary bodies are magnetic that they are as I said big huge magnets and that things um, that are dropped on their surfaces 
will go down in a straight line because of that magnetic force. So you've got the introduction of the idea of a magnetic force that's keeping this universe going, basically, and keeping these planets in orbit. But there's a problem with this. Um, how can I say this? But, but this doesn't solve the idea of um, why uh, planets will go in a circular or elliptical motion in their orbits. Because what uh, Descartes had recognized, as we saw earlier, is that um, the idea of inertia is that a body that is placed in motion will continue in a straight line motion until another force acts upon it. So really, if these planets are traveling along, you know, some kind of orbit, but obey the same laws of motion that you see on Earth, then they should be traveling in straight lines. They shouldn't be going in a circle. They should be flying off at a tangent from that circle. Um, actually, I'll come back to this in just a second. I thought I was going to go in a different order with this, but let me just explain to you. So. Um, and don't worry about the centripetal force right now. I just want to show you this idea that um, the idea was it was sort of recognized that, like I said, if planets follow the same rules of motion that a stone falling to Earth, you know, that um, would follow. So basically, if, if terrestrial and celestial mechanics are the same, which is increasingly accepted and recognized moving into the 17th century, then these planets shouldn't go in a circle around the sun, for instance, and the moon shouldn't go in a circle around the earth. Sorry, that's a terrible circle. Um, instead, what it should do is it should fly off this orbit. It should be going straight off at a tangent. Um, why? does it follow this circular path instead of the, a straight line motion? And so what Hooke realizes is that it's because of the magnetism, the magnetic properties of the planets, that's what keeps these planets in orbit. So if they are shot out into space with enough force, they will end up in an orbit around a celestial, another celestial body. And in, in our solar system, the sun is the center of these different uh, planetary orbits. Um, so in when the Earth is orbiting around the sun, it's gotten enough force to get into this orbit, but it doesn't go off into a straight line because it doesn't follow then what we would expect in terms of the laws of inertia and then you know, fly off at some tangent in a straight line because the sun is constantly attracting it back. So there's actually two forces at work here. You've got um, the force of inertia or the force that, uh, um, that once the planet is in motion, it's going to stay in motion. Um, but it's that's supposed to be a straight line motion. But what makes it curve is a second force that comes from the magnetic force that we call today gravity. Um, because of the force of gravity, because of that magnetic force, um, that second force, it acts on the, the rectilinear, the inertial force, to then bring that object constantly back into a curved motion. Um, so let me go back to then what Hooke's, um, the realization that Hooke comes to. He realizes that all celestial bodies whatsoever, and I should say this is an old, written in old 17th century English, and that's why you'll see strange spelling. Um, he said all celestial bodies whatsoever have an attraction or a gravitating power towards their own centers, whereby they attract not only their own parts, which means that if you're if you're standing on the surface of the earth and you drop a stone it's going to go straight down to earth pretty much more or less there's a few little teeny uh, um, alterations with that due to the force of gravity but we won't worry about that we'll just say it's going to go straight down to earth because it's natural rectilinear motion um, so it's going to tend toward the center of earth because that's the center of its magnetic um, attraction um, so let me go back to where I was. So they're going to, 
uh, have an attraction or gravitating power towards their own centers whereby they attract not only their own parts, so they're going to attract the things on Earth to Earth, um, but they also keep things from flying off from them. So now we have a new explanation. Instead of impetus theory, now we see why things um, stay on Earth and don't just fly off as the Earth is, is spinning around. It's not because of an impetus, a force of impetus. It's because of this magnetic attraction. It's because of gravity. Um, so it keeps them from flying off, as we may observe the Earth to do. Um, but that they do also attract all other celestial bodies which are within the sphere of their activity. So then what Hooke is also saying here is that all the planets of the solar system are attracting each other. So it's not just the Earth is attracted to the Sun and the Moon is attracted to the Earth, but that all of the planets in the solar system have huge magnetic fields and they will all um, affect the orbits of each other. And that's basically why you don't see circular orbits, but instead you see um, elliptical orbits. Um, so let me then explain to you how it was that Hooke came up with this idea. Basically what he realized, he took the, 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 um, the, the instrument of the pendulum, and he actually adapts this from another uh, natural philosopher, Christian uh, Huygens, who I'm, I'm not going to talk about here. And there's also another guy, Borelli, who, who constitutes another step between, say, Descartes and Hooke. And I'm not going to talk about him either. I wanted to not um, uh, overwhelm you with too many names. But just so you know that there are other sort of more detailed steps um, within this. Um, but anyway, so what Hooke does is he takes a pendulum where you have basically a ball suspended from a central hook or central point um, that can then oscillate from it. Um, and if you push that pendulum um, in a way that is, is basically perpendicular uh, to the, um, the line of the string itself, it, and you push it hard enough, it will actually make a circle. And from that, then Huygens and then Hooke were able to derive the idea of what we call a centripetal force. Um, so again, if you basically what they noticed was that if you sort of, th you know, throw this pendulum into, you know, kind of an orbit, you're going to get a circular motion, which you can see um, in both of these basically diagrams. Don't worry about that that right triangle there, we won't worry about that. Um, you can really see it sort of from, from this diagram too, that if this is a pendulum and then this little square is sort of going around, it's going with, if you, if you move it in the right direction with enough force, it's going to create a circle. And so what Hook realized then is that if you've got, um, if you then transfer this to the idea of planets, where you've got a center a central axis here, axis point of magnetic attraction that basically is going to, it's going to hold these planets in a circular orbit very, in a very similar way to what you see with the pendulum because there are going to be two forces at work here. On the one hand, you're going to have the centripetal, I'm sorry, the inertial force or what's called here the velocity, a straight line in a particular direction. That force is going to tend make the planet tend to want to fly off from the orbit. But at the same time, it's constantly being attracted back to this magnetic center so that at the same time that it should be flying off into its tangential rectilinear motion, it should also be falling straight into the sun. Um, if you didn't have that inertial motion going on, these, the planets would all have just fallen straight into the sun and kind of been, I guess, sucked up into, a, I don't know, a big black hole or I don't know what. But, but because you've got this initial inertial force that, you know, threw these planets out into space and at the same time you had this magnetic attraction where then they're constantly being kind of pulled back to the sun, these two forces balance out to create what should be a circular orbit, but because of the influence of the magnetism of the other planets, it gets stretched out into an elliptical orbit, basically. Um, so Hook comes up with the idea that you see these circular motions because of the interaction of two forces, the force of um, inertia and then the centripetal force 
based upon the magnetism of the, the center of these magnetic planetary bodies. So I hope that is clear. It's kind of a complicated point. So if this is not at all not clear to you, definitely um, let me know. Uh, I think this is one of the more, most sort of complex um, ideas of physics that we're going to be encountering in this class. So again, if any, any problem with this, you let me know. Um, but he summed it up in this quote as well, where he said, I have an idea of compounding the celestial motions of the planets of a direct motion by the tangent. So that's that rectilinear straight motion that should come out of inertia and an attractive motion toward the central body. So that's then the, the magnetic attraction of the planets, say, for the sun or of the moon for the earth. And that those two together, again, are what, what explain why we see circular or elliptical um, orbits, basically. And then here um, is another diagram that will sort of hopefully kind of pull it together. So here's the Earth with its magnetic center, you know, right in the center there. It's exerting a magnetic pull of gravity on the moon. Um, and in that sense, the moon should just is, is simultaneously being pulled to the Earth, straight into the Earth, because of that magnetic pull. But at the same time, because of its inertia, it's also pulled in this direction, in this straight line motion, ta tangential, as a tangent to that orbit. And those two motions together end up making this, basically, this circular orbit. So um, hopefully, like I said, that's clear um, that and, and what I like about this diagram, too, is it, they would show you that for the um, magnetic gravitational force, um, if that were the only force, then the moon would go straight in. It would be sucked right into the Earth. Um, if there were no gravitational force, the moon would fly off, you know, <laughs> right out of its orbit and be, you know, who knows where. Um, but it certainly wouldn't be orbiting the Earth. But these two together are what keep, these two forces together are what keep the moon in orbit around the Earth. Okay, so, um, and then here's another sort of example of, of Hooke's thinking. What he noticed was that it, at, say, say something's moving along a tangent, or, or, I'm sorry, a straight line. Actually, let me go up to, to point C. Something's moving along a straight line up, say, through point C. Then say it, this force G comes along and pushes it to the, to the center of N, it's pushing it in, then that will change its direction and make it go toward this point, this um, cursive B. Uh, then again, you'll have another force that then pushes it toward N that then alters its um, direction and pushes it toward point A. Well, you, you can start to see this, this polygon that is starting that is going to result from these different motions you put enough points on that and you put them close together you're going to end up with a circle and and ho hopefully you're also seeing this then derives from some of Descartes uh, ideas and writings about the um, what happens when one corpuscle moves you know um, hits another it'll be going along in a straight line motion it gets hit by another corpuscle and then it gets um, pushed off its track into another direction and so again this helped to um, to show hook what was happening with this centripetal force um, that um, with the basically by looking at this model of particles and how they would change direction if pushed into a certain direction, this is also what led Hook to his um, ideas about planetary motion and explaining uh, the circular, I should say, the elliptical orbits of the planets. Uh, so that takes us to then Isaac Newton because Hook obviously has great ideas. Um, not only has he now explained why we see planets in elliptical orbits. He's identified um, a magnetic force from the planets. He's identified um, the centripetal force. And he's accepted the idea of inertia. And he has also shown once and for all that the laws of motion governing uh, motion on Earth are the same as those governing the planets uh, in the universe. 
And so this dichotomy between the celestial and the terrestrial realm has now been collapsed uh, for good. But Hooke was not enough of a mathematician to then be able to figure out what the exact gravitational pull was on these planets. Um, he was not able to then formulate mathematical laws um, to explain uh, the different speeds at which the planets rotated and to explain the the actual force of gravity, say, between the Earth and the Sun, between Mars and the Sun, Jupiter and the Sun, uh, the Earth and the Moon, etc. So he, and this is, I'm not trying to take anything away from him, I think it, this is a brilliant realization that he's come to, but he, he did not have the mathematical ability to um, come up with the formulas for that. The person who did was Isaac Newton, uh, a, a really interesting character in the history of science, obviously extremely famous and and quite celebrated. As, he's probably the quintessential uh, hero of science and the scientific revolution. Um, like I said, a, a very celebrated figure. Um, and it's said that, that Newton actually, and I mean, Newton claims this as well, but um, it, it said that, that Newton actually came up with the idea of basically the centripetal force or these the the dual forces of the inertial motion with the gravitational pull um, about the same time as Hooke or possibly even before him, but he hadn't published his findings uh, yet. Um, and we'll find the same thing with Darwin where he actually claims to have come up with the idea of, of evolution by natural selection at the same time as uh, another uh, naturalist did. Um, actually, he, he says he, he came up with the idea um, actually a number of years prior to that, but hadn't published his findings. And then when someone else did, he said, wait, 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 I thought of this first. Um, so it's a little bit of this with, with Newton, uh, but I certainly want to give uh, Hook his, his credit here as well. So anyway, Isaac Newton um, was... So you can see here uh, the tomb of Newton in Westminster Abbey, again showing how uh, important he is considered to be, what a hero in the history of science uh, he is, a very part of sort of a proud English tradition. And here are some statues of Newton. And here he is on the one pound note. Uh, it's got interesting hairdo there, but <laughs> that's actually typical of the sort of late 17th and early 18th century to have these sort of curly wigs. Uh, as I'm sure anybody who's seen pictures of George Washington uh, would know that as well. Uh, anyway, so Newton came from relatively humble origins, um, not from a wealthy family. Uh, he does uh, manage to get to study at the University of Cambridge, but he had to start out uh, as basically acting as a servant to other students in order to be able to to pay for it. He actually had to uh, wait wait on the other students, and this didn't sit too well with him. Uh, he also was, I should say, his father died uh, when he was only a few months old, and his mother remarried to a stepfather whom he just absolutely hated, and he seems to have been a kind of a, a really taciturn, kind of um, quiet, sort of conf conflicted uh, man. That's always sort of the sense that I get from him, this this absolute uh, genius who uh, probably didn't have a real strong uh, social skills, um, but at the same time, you know, was able to go on to uh, a great and very successful career. Uh, he ends up getting a scholarship so he doesn't have to be a, a servant anymore, and then eventually succeeds one of his professors um, to a chair at the University of Cambridge. He also becomes a member of the Royal Society uh, later in life, and then is the president of the Royal Society, which is basically, he at that point, he had reached the, the top of the kind of scientific hierarchy of 17th century uh, 18th century England, and um, and so he does go on to some some great success. Uh, he was starts out 
uh, his sort of scientific endeavors by being very interested in uh, the idea of light. How does light work? What is light composed of? And he constructed actually a reflecting telescope that he sent to the Royal Society in 1672 to kind of impress them. Uh, and, it, and it did. Um, he, uh, in part through the use of that telescope, was able to come up with the idea of the refraction of light into different colors. Um, in this case, using a a prism to do that, but those are some of his early achievements in the field of optics, uh, basically the behavior of light and how the eye perceives light. And then he becomes very interested in astronomy. Uh, he reads Descartes. Uh, he has a correspondence going on with Robert Hooke. And he is a convinced uh, corpuscularian. Uh, he's a convinced uh, Copernican. I mean, no self-respecting scientists by the mid-17th century would, would not be a Copernican. Uh, and he wanted to do something similar to what Descartes did in terms of, you know, replacing uh, Aristotle's system with his own. Uh, but whereas Descartes wrote a book called Principles of Philosophy, uh, Newton was never able to come up with a complete system, uh, explanatory system of his own. But what he did come up with was a series of mathematical laws to explain the system of the world, or I should say to um, to explain not in the sense of explaining why these things came into being, which was what Descartes was trying to do. Uh, Newton realized that he never was able to do that, but he could at least explain the laws that he saw uh, in terms of mathematical formulations. So he's able to, again, explain kinematics and motion, but is not as successful at dynamics at explaining where these motions come from and why they are there. And I'll pick this up at the end of the lecture. Again, Newton saw this as sort of his, his major uh, failing in the end that he was never able to come up with an alternate um, explanation as to what the force of gravity actually consisted of and instead had to just uh, stay with the idea that it's this, um, this unseeable uh, force. Uh, and in that way, it, it smacked too much of Aristotelian ideas of inherent natures and inherent potentialities for Newton to be really comfortable with it, but he couldn't figure out a mechanical explanation, basically, for the force of gravity. Um, so his book uh, is then entitled The Mathematical Principles of Natural Philosophy. Rather than just principles of philosophy, he has to qualify it and say it's mathematical principles of natural philosophy, not of all philosophy, not of moral philosophy, um, but just uh, natural philosophy. Um, but in that sense, he in that way, he was extremely uh, successful, and he came up with a, a whole series of laws, actually. And first, I'm going to go through what are known as, as Newton's laws of motion, uh, and then talk about the law of gravitational force that he was able to come up with. He was able to take that final step that Robert Hooke uh, never was, and actually put um, mathematical uh, a mathematical formula together to be able to actually determine uh, gravitational force. And in doing that, he was he used Kepler's laws and then was able to actually prove Kepler's uh, laws of planetary motion that way as well. Um, okay, so Newton's laws of motion first, and you will you will see uh, lots of remnants of Descartes' ideas here, of Hooke's ideas, and even and, and of things that that Galileo was was doing as well, kind of formulated in into this culmination, basically, of, of Newton's laws. Newton's laws of motion are basically the, a culmination of, of sort of a century of work on matter and motion and kinematics that he's put together here. So his first law of motion is that every object will continue in a state of rest um, or will proceed at a constant speed in a straight line unless acted on by an external force. So this is basically the law of inertia. Um, his second law is basically when a net force or when a force acts on an object, 
the object will accelerate in the direction of the force. Um, and that acceleration is directly proportional to the amount of force. And it is inversely proportional, which means um, it will go the kind of the opposite. Well, let me back up. It's inversely proportional to mass. So what this means is that the stronger the force on something, the stronger the push, the greater the acceleration is going to be. Um, but that is inversely proportional to mass. So you would um, basically, the heavier it is, then the slower it will accelerate. But the lighter it is, the faster it will accelerate. Um, and I'll, I'll go through these too. I'll show you more examples of this in just a minute. And Newton's third law is that whenever um, you have a force that's placed on an object, uh, and it will exert an equal and opposite force um, to it. Uh, so, and I, sh I just want to say then, we see in, in, in law number one, we can see Descartes' idea of inertia. In law number two, we can see then an adaptation of Galileo's ideas about um, acceleration. So here's Newton's first law at work, basically, you know, um, objects that are in motion will stay in motion in a straight line until another force acts upon it. Um, so an object at rest will remain at rest unless acted on it by another force. So that soccer ball will sit there until somebody kicks it. Then it will continue in a straight line motion until another force acts on it. And so now we get to some to projectiles. So think about you've kicked a soccer ball. It goes up in the air. Does it just go into straight lines straight out into space? No. Then in without you know before too long it starts to curve back to earth so why do you think it's curving back to earth it's because of the gravitational magnetic pull of the earth's center then starts to act upon that inertial force and then bring it back to earth in a curve so now we also have an explanation for projectile motion as well um, and then here's an example then of newton's second law so if you're you know, pushing a cart with a really heavy box on it, it's going to, say you push it really hard, it's going to, you know, accelerate to a certain extent. But if you, if you push it harder, it's going to accelerate faster uh, and go further. Um, if the box is lighter on that cart, it's going to, again, accelerate further and go faster. Um, if you put more force on it, it's going to do that. But if the box gets heavier and heavier and heavier, then even with that same amount of force, you go to push it with the same amount of force, it's not going to accelerate as quickly. It's not going to go as far before the force of, res of, of basically friction or resistance eventually slows it down. And here's an example of Newton's third law then if you push your finger against a wall, the wall is going to push back at the same force. Um, you go to the row a boat and the force that you put into the paddle into the water is going to propel the boat forward. Um, the same with the balloon. If you've ever let go of a balloon, you'll see that it kind of flies all around the room because of the force of the air uh, leaving it. So these are just some examples of Newton's third law at work. And then and something to remember here is that law all of these laws then apply in space as well as on Earth for Newton. And this was then a big realization that he had, like Hook, that uh, that led him then to the law of gravity. And there's this story that um, Newton was sitting there and an apple fell on his head and all of a sudden he realized that the motion of the planets in orbit could be then related to the motions on Earth. And if he could understand earthly motions, he could use those then to demonstrate heavenly motions as well. Um, you know, who knows if this is actually true uh, on the um, on the internet. It said that, that this tree on the right hand side might be a descendant of the apple tree uh, that Newton sat under and the apple fell on his head. Uh, it's 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 unclear. Um, I thought the, the left hand uh, image was kind of funny with, you know, Newton texting on his phone. Um, but anyway, uh, whether or not it's true, you know, this anecdote, Newton definitely did come to the realization that, again, earthly mechanics were going to 
be reflected in heavenly mechanics and vice versa. And this allows him then to propose the law of, of gravitational motion. He basically takes Kepler's laws and Hooke's ideas as well as his, as his own about um, centripetal force. And he's able to, from Kepler's laws of planetary motion, he's able to then derive a law of gravity. And that law of gravity then uh, brought together the realization that gravity pulls objects, say the gravity on Earth will pull objects toward its center, whether they're objects in space or objects on the Earth's crust itself, they will be pulled down toward the center of the Earth. At the same time, inertial motion um, is what makes things then, you know, go off into um, a straight line motion in the direction of the force that's propelling it, you put those two together, you get a curve. Um, and you have a big enough curve and you end up with an ellipse or a circle, basically. Uh, and so he's able to then put these ideas together and as I said, make a mathematical formula formula where he can literally figure out the force of gravity between that you know between the sun and the earth and basically between all of the planets and the sun and then even calculate how much um, influence the different magnetic poles of the different planet orbiting planets have on each other as well um, so Newton's law of gravitation says that everything in the universe attracts everything else in the universe the more massive the objects, the stronger the force of attraction. And I should also add to that, the closer the objects are, the stronger the force of attraction as well. So the, the, so the strength of gravitational force depends upon the distance between the two um, attracting bodies and their mass. So we're at mass, meaning basically uh, their weight, how, how heavy, how huge, you know, how big they are, how dense they are, what their mass is. So here it is in, um, you know, uh, the, the full uh, formula. Um, here's his law of gravity. So it says the force of gravity between two bodies is proportional to their masses and inversely proportional to the square of their separation. The force of gravity is always attractive. Um, so to just sort of pull that apart and clarify it a little bit, the force of gravity, so the F there on the left-hand side, is equal to a gravitational constant um, times multiplied by the mass of each of the two bodies that are being attracted to each other. So in this case, the sun, I mean, I, I say in the case of the sun and the earth, it would be you multiply their masses together, multiply them by the gravitational constant, and then you would divide by the square of the radius, um, which is basically the distance that um, separates the centers of these two bodies. So basically what all that means is the further apart they are, the weaker the gravitational force between them. The closer together they are, the stronger the gravitational force. The bigger and heavier they are, the more mass they have, then the greater the gravitational force. Um, the smaller they are, the weaker the gravitational force. So that's basically um, what Newton comes up with. It's a, it's a proportion, but it's also a formula by which once you know the mass of, of the different heavenly bodies, and once you know their distance distances apart from each other, you can calculate the gravitational pull between in every orbit of the of the solar system and not only that but um, Newton was also able to prove Kepler's laws of planetary motion and especially that third law of the the proportions and the um, between the different uh, orbits and through that he was also like I said a few minutes ago he was able to then determine why it's an elliptical motion and why they speed up and slow down in these elliptical orbits um, due to the pull of different planets as they go as they get closer say as the earth gets closer to um, you know neighboring planets uh, then those are going to pull it slightly um, out of its traditional sort of circular motion that it would have had with centrifugal force, centripetal force. So, um, so Newton was able to explain again why things speed up, why they slow down, why there's 
um, elliptical motion in addition to being able to calculate the exact um, gravitational force between the different um, uh, I should say within the different orbits of the solar system. So this was an absolute amazing uh, breakthrough. People recognized at the time and even you know up through the present day just how important this was. And as I said, this makes Newton basically a kind of made him into a scientific hero. He becomes the president of the Royal Society. He's he's um, very very highly respected. Um, so let me just show you. Here's one other diagram just to sort of. You can see this again, where the force equals the two masses multiplied by the gravitational constant divided by um, the square of the distance between the, the two of them, the two bodies. And then one last one I just wanted to show you that sort of sums everything up, that the further away a planet gets, say, from the sun, the less the gravitational force. Um, and then you can, that's on the left-hand side, and then on the right-hand side, again, you can see that that the orbiting motion is a combination of the inertial motion and then of the gravitational pull of the sun on the earth. Um, and then again this just sort of saying it in a different way, um, any two objects in the universe experience a force of mutual attraction. This force is proportional to the product of the two masses and inversely proportional to the square of the distance between them. Um, so hopefully you know, in, in all of these different uh, versions of the law of gravity, this will make sense now. I hope this is an overkill, but I just wanted to make sure that I, I made it uh, as clear to you as possible. And this also said that then based upon the, this law, he was able to derive all of Kepler's laws of planetary motion. So Kepler's laws not only helped him, but then he was able to reinforce Kepler's law after he came up with this as well. So as I said, this makes him into a hero, but Newton wasn't fully satisfied with this because he's a corpuscularian. He's an atomist. He wants the world to be full of particles. He wants to be able to explain all motion based upon um, forces of particles hitting other particles. But with the idea of gravity, he's forced to um, rely upon the idea of a force, um, no pun intended with that, that he can't see that isn't the direct result of one particle pushing another. Gravitational magnetic force is um, very similar to the kinds of forces and natures that Aristotle had talked about, that when he talked about each body has has these innate uh, forces and potentialities um, and, and these final causes that will make it turn into what it is destined to be, this is similar to this gravitational force, which is this sort of inherent characteristic of certain kinds of, of matter. And Newton kept trying to figure out if he could see gravitational particles or some kind of mechanism beyond this sort of invisible force that was pulling, you know, bodies toward the sun. And he never could. And this always made him uncomfortable because he was trying to construct a new science and a new universe that didn't rely on these kinds of, you know, invisible forces or what they called action at a distance. Um, and here he has put an invisible force right back into, you know, smack dab in the center of the entire solar system. And it's what makes this solar system work. And so he was always kind of uncomfortable with this and felt like it, he was a bit of a failure uh, because of it. And I'll just show you this, um, um, this final quote from uh, the series of queries that he, he writes later on in which he said, um, have not the small particles of bodies certain powers, virtues, or forces by which they act at a distance, not only upon the rays of light for reflecting, refracting, and inflecting them, but also upon one another for producing a great part of the phenomena of nature. So here he's ref he's he's recognizing these invisible forces in nature that act at a distance. Just the things he was trying to get rid of, he's forced to recognize that there are such things um, in nature and that we have to basically deal with them.
He said, nature will be very conformable to herself and very simple, performing all the great motions of all the heavenly bodies by the attraction of gravity, which intercedes those bodies, and almost all the small ones of their particles by some other attractive and repelling powder powers, which intercede the particles. So what this basically means is that what he sees in nature is that virtually all bodies have attractive and repelling properties, properties by which they either attract each other or they repel each other. And this is how you explain a lot of how nature works. So you can't just have particle acting upon particle. There are these invisible, attractive, and repulsive, um, repelling, I should say, forces in nature, something he didn't want to have to recognize, but he ultimately does uh, recognize the absolute need for that. And for anybody who studied uh, chemistry, the subject of uh, what we're going to be looking at next week, you'll know that, you know, a, um, a, attraction and re and repulsion or, or you know, repelling of objects is absolutely central to the whole idea of our, our modern idea of atomism and um, chemical reactions basically so he's forced to recognize this he's disappointed by it but um, but this contribution of the law of gravitation um, allows the uh, Copernican revolution to conclude once and for all and now we have sort of a truly new paradigm and a new universe by which natural philosophers and scientists are going to be uh, pursuing the study of nature.